Lisa C. <laughs> oi, oi. Oi, oi. <laughs> I don't talk like that anymore. I moved out of London and I've kind oh, of been I know you've changed, haven't you? Speaking properly. <laughs> Turned to a popo country girl now, ain't ya? Mm. <laughs> I like your background, by the way. It's just something I pulled off the internet because my background, I've got, this is my um, art wall behind me and it's a bit crazy. It's got all sorts of artwork on it. So is it actual vinyl or is that wall, a wallpaper? That's a, that's a, like a background. It's a picture that I pulled off the internet and you use it as a background. Oh, look. That's, oh, not, that's not in my house. If you oh, can use it. Oh, that's that well good. Weird, yeah. But it's just so that you don't see all my crazy artwork on the wall. Some of it's okay. mad. <laughs> okay. So Lisa, Lisa C, tell everyone who you are. What who is Lisa C? Because you're you're one of the first, like on the circuit, one of the first like house garage DJ, female DJs on the on the circuit. Um, how did it start? It's weird because I never actually ever played a garage set. People um I, I was purely a house DJ and it was more soulful house than the funky house, but my career, I just landed in it. Um, always loved music, um, but was did a multitude of jobs when I left school. And I have ADHD, so I could never settle on anything. Um, but I started um, doing promo for AIM Records, the record label, which was a garage label. And that's where everyone associated me with garage, um, Lisa C, AIM Records. Um, started just doing like online promo and stuff for them. Um, then it sort of went to sort of more managerial. I would go around the record shops with the vinyl, um, take care of all like all stuff on the website, sales and and all of that sort of stuff. Um, a little bit of A&R. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like taking artists to clubs. Like I can remember when Katie B was 15 and her mum saying, please look after my daughter. So oh. take her to nightclubs at night and walking her in and out and, she was just a baby and like looking at her now she's just amazing I'm so proud of her um but yeah it sort of everything started in the garage scene but I started to go on people's radio shows with the AIM record stuff and promoting it and then people started saying you know you're you're good on the radio why don't you just do a show to just an AIM record show um so I started that but I never I, I just sort of just went into it and just played house really and I'd showcase bits of AIM records but um yeah it was predominantly a house show and I started off with Lucy Lou didn't I on True FM yeah. um and that was before we started the Vinyl Vixens we were on True FM together I sort of piggybacked her show for a while um and it that was a laugh and that and she used to make me mix live on air so yeah. I was there to mix and we had fun with that um and then yeah then we started the Vinyl Vixens and that was sort of where DJing took off for me um and I was really lucky because I got residencies with some of the best promoters, like Bobby well, the and The biggest Cindy ones Purple. as well. Yeah, you're, yeah that's, that's what I mean, the best. Um, yeah. Like Back to 95, Groove Odyssey, History of House, so many different. And I went abroad. I was really lucky. I was taken abroad a few times and had some really good times with other girl DJs as well, which was um, fun times. So how, um, so how does London's Unique free fit into your, your history? London's what? Unique free. That wasn't me. Would you, you definitely so you wasn't you wasn't part of because did you do any PR work for them or anything? Was it PR work you did for them or no, no. your vinyl with London's unique free? This is back in the day. Or my I, I might have distributed it for them. Yeah, I know okay. I used to like get used because I used to go around the record shops every Saturday. So if someone had a box or something um and they didn't fancy it themselves. Then yeah, I would I would take it with me. Um, oh, but then everything yeah. I sort of joined that when vinyl was dying, so it was quite a sad time. Record shops were shutting down. Yeah. Um, everything was going digital, um, and I took on the process of digitalizing all of AIM Records back cat and stuff. Um, and yeah, that was that was sad times because CDJs were getting put in the clubs and people yeah. complaining they couldn't take their vinyl anymore. Yeah, um, yeah, it was a real, real big transitional time that I sort of. Um, began my career in and then that sort of I progressed I learned on vinyl and I was on CDJs by the time we were playing at, at the same sets and stuff what's well, at the same parties and stuff so yeah it was a mad fast transition really so what are your influences sorry what are your influences 
who influenced you into DJ? What got you into it? Um, I don't know. I was always a, like always had the radio on, always into music. I bought my first bit of vinyl when I was fourteen, and it was <laughs> I walked around record shops singing it because um, I didn't know the name of it. It was <laughs> I used to call it the suitcase song, but it was Break of Dawn, Rhythm on the Loose. But that song um, and sort of the period before that, I, I sort of came from hardcore. Um, went into the the jungle and the ragged jungle and then drum and bass and when drum and bass then went jump up and really fast I was like no I'm not having that and I found house and garage I think I was about 15 16 and I would make my own mixtapes um, and give them out to people with all the best tunes um, I'd spend my money on that as well like looking back my mates never like it's like oh cheers yeah and they thought nothing of it but I was like they were my masterpieces um so yeah, then I found House and Garage and that was it for me. I, I I couldn't listen to the to the drum and bass. I just started feeling old and I was only in my 20s by that point. Um, it was just too fast. It was like a techno speed, you know, and that was just was too much for me. So, um, so, so what, what DJs inspired? Is there any DJs that you look up to, anyone that inspires you? Um, I, I followed Masters at Work for years. I bought all of their stuff or every everything that came out of theirs um, and India. Those, look, even just saying India, my hairs go on end. Those tracks for me were iconic from my my raving days, like Gas Club and, and all that in London. I was getting in those clubs underage. I was naughty, um, but I just had to have that music. And it was, um, I don't know, it's just a massive part of my life. But... That era, I don't know, because the the hardcore and like the stuff that I'm making, that I'm producing at the moment is very reminiscent of, of the 90s, the early 90s, sort of hardcore, sort of jungle, piano-y sort of rave stuff, but not fast. I prefer yeah. the slow stuff. Um, I got signed to a couple of labels, actually, with some of my break stuff a few years ago, um, but then I took a break from, from making music. So, yeah, I think... I'm inspired mostly by my childhood, the stuff that I remember from my childhood, like the 88 to, to 92 house as well. Um, that's, that really influences my music as well. Um, so it's not so much artists, it's it's genres. Um, I very much, I love all genres, um, apart from like real heavy metal and stuff that makes me feel angry. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna get, get the ump, do you know what I mean? But I love all music, so it's really hard for me to, to pick any influences because, I mean, I know all the words to, to Everly Brothers tracks from when I was a kid that I could still sing to you now from where my mum and, like, Bob Marley and all the things that she raised me on, I can still remember all the words to those songs. So I guess I'm just influenced by everything. I just love music and what it does for your soul. I remember, I remember a few years ago, probably about five or so years ago, you sent me a drum and bass track. You were like... Listen to something I've done, and um, yeah, so it looks like you haven't turned turned back from that. You, you, you've just kept going with the drum and bass by the sounds of it. Yeah, kind of that drum and bass breaks. I mean, I, I make music now for dance schools and people's media content, and they'll ask me for something really specific. Um, so lately, I've been making like trappy sort of uh, dubstepy, like real. Like noises that would scare me I wouldn't put them in my track but it's some of them are just amazing like for the kids to dance to with all these mad actions that they're doing um so yeah I, I don't know I just I don't know what influences me really I've got ADHD so my brain can't settle on any any one thing so I'll tell you that's my favorite and five minutes later I go oh no no that's my favorite and then an hour later I go no no this one's my favorite so yeah, it's, it's, I'm just influenced by all music and, and what makes my ears stand on end, you know? Yeah. We're so, all different. Music's subjective, isn't it? So speaking about production, you made a track um, that is well-deserved to be in the charts right now. Uh, look at this one. Because <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, but this track, like... I was like, wow, this track needs to be released. I know you told me what's what. Yeah. Um, but I still I'm still I'm still gonna bug you to push to, to release that. Even if you have to contact whoever you need to contact, 
I mm. think people need to hear the track because the track has has oomph to it. it, has something to it. You might need to change the video. Yes, we spoke about the video and that. Yeah, but that was a road video, as they used to call them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what, 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 how, how did that come about? How did that song come about? Um, well, we started the Vinyl Vixens, all female DJ collective, and um, we decided to to get anywhere um, or to be noticed. We would need to start producing and put tracks out there because it's it's apparent that uh, producers get more, you know, a lot more gigs because on the strength of their track and live PAs and things like that. So we started off by doing something shocking. Um, which was my nani, and that truly shocked everyone. And I did a live PA of that in Ministry of Sound, walking up and down the bar with a wig on, long boots. It was it was madness, and we we called me something different, so it wasn't me. It was a, like a persona. Um, so we did that, and that got everyone's attention. And the Foxy Ladies came afterwards, and I wrote the lyrics for that too, um, but didn't write the. The instrumental I wasn't producing properly then I was learning so and the same with my nani so I I sort of only have the um the written sort of input on on those um but yeah it was just a follow-on and we wanted to do something fun and at the time YouTube was getting big and people were filming their kids doing stuff um but looking back on it now um I probably wouldn't do that again with all those children and asking people to put their children online <laughs> um hindsight doesn't it's not not the greatest idea um now that I've got kids I didn't have kids at the time so I obviously wasn't in that mindset but everyone was quite happy to yeah yeah take my child's video put it <laughs> on your your music video but it was cute like you know looking back on it now I can see like my friends kids when they were really little and me when I was really young <laughs> Like 20 years ago, madness. Um, but yeah, that was just supposed to be a follow-up. And I think it was just a little bit of ahead of its time. It was. Like you say now. Yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of thing has sort of come come around. And yeah. yeah, it's just very cheesy for me. Do you know what I mean? If you were to put that next to things that I produce, it would it's very cringe for me now. Yeah. Um, and that's why when you said about it, I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> leave that one where it where it is yeah but you know it, it's like it's like Wigfield is it Wigfield Saturday night, Saturday yeah. night. Yeah. I, yeah it's a cheesy song but yeah don't get me wrong, when I'm doing private events and I drop that the, the place just goes mad it, it erupts because yeah. it's yeah. everyone loves a bit of cheese don't they yeah they love a bit of cheese so yeah they do especially when they've been drinking yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so so tell me tell me an, an embarrassing moment been on stage or DJing, any embarrassing moments that have ever, ever happened, like the vinyl stopped halfway through? Uh, uh, yeah. Do you know what? There was one. Um, it was at SE1 Club and it was, was it Groove Odyssey or History of House? I can't remember which one it was, but we were up on this, it felt like we were up on scaffolding and yeah. I was nervous enough anyway and there was a malfunction, one of the CDJs kept sticking and we were all made aware of it and they were trying to replace it. Oh, and no. it just, just so happened that my CDs just like, we just stopped halfway through a track. And it, it, it's, your heart's doing that because everyone's sort of is silence for a minute and that silence seems to go on for so yeah. long. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I managed, I just pressed play on whatever was in the next deck and, and just kept going. But yeah, stressful times and I, I wasn't, I think I was only about a year into DJing then. So yeah, it was um it was my first choke as we called it. But it wasn't my actually my doing. Oh, and the amount of times on radio that I'd walk away from the mixer with my headphones plugged in and nearly oh, drag yeah. everything yeah. like that that was something that I would do a lot in the first few months. And then I just got into the habit of unplugging, but I dreaded doing that in a club. <laughs> but never did, thankfully. And what about, tell me something fun. Tell me something funny, like fun, a fun, a fun uh, gig. Is there a gig that, that you'll, you'll always remember that was so, so lively, exciting, it was fun. It's probably your best gig. What's your I best think, ever gig? I think one of my most memorable was in Cyprus when we were playing, was it the Ladies of House or something? But we, 
we got sent to this other nightclub on another night um apart from the main night and it was on the top of the cliff yeah and whilst dj it's like the wind was coming in off the sea and it was like gale force wind um and we were djing in this gale force wind like hair was going in your mouth and your headphones were getting tangled in your hair and it was it was really just comical and we all ended up just drinking and just just getting on with it really yeah. um yeah that that was a crazy one for me that stands out definitely so, so the final Vixens, it was you and who else in the final? And Lucy Lou, Lucy Lou. Um, we did a few things where we would do a room, like I think we did um, we did upstairs at History of House at Ministry of Sound in the bar, and we would invite other ladies to come. So we had um, Lady T, Anarchist, um, and Mix C, and DJ Jolie also yes. join us. So yeah, it was nice. Um, and then it was some of us that then went out and did the ladies of house in cyprus um and that that was a real laugh because we all stayed in a villa together and it was it was a good few days um of um djing and just being in the sun and enjoying um chilling out with other girl djs yeah it's, it's believe it or not we're you know it's, it's still a pretty male dominated industry and to get a, like a group of us together was was a real laugh we're going to come to that in a second, actually. But for those that don't know, Lisa C was one of the first female DJs to play at Back to 95 alongside Joe Lee and Lady Jewissa. I think you three were like the first three female DJs. I think Lady T was before me as well, because she was already on House FM before I joined. So, yeah, I think probably one of the... Yeah, yeah, those, those uh, first, yeah. So, so what was it like in the early stages being in a male-dominated industry? Well, coming from South London, I was sort of I was a bit of a cheeky chappy girl. I've always been a bit of a tomboy, so I've never had any problem getting on with fellas. Um, I can't, I used to walk around and go, "All right, bro, oi, oi," you know. <laughs> um, yeah, radio meetings and stuff. I, I just sort of blended in. Um, but yeah, nowadays I'm a complete, I'm, I'm a different kettle of fish. I'm not so, um, so loud and shouty. I'm quite reserved now. I think spending a long time in the studio on your own kind of makes you appreciate peace and quiet. I could, I couldn't go out and do a DJ set now. I don't think, cause I'm, I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I'm knackered by 10 o'clock. And loud music irritates me most of the time now. So I'm just like, I've become a granny before my time. Yeah. Uh, it's having children, but music's still a massive part of my life because I make it and I'm doing adverts and things like that. But um, I just haven't got the energy to go out and, and be out past midnight even now. I can't yeah. imagine not being in my bed at midnight. <laughs> so do people still um, ring you up with bookings trying to get you to DJ? I do sometimes get people ask me if I would be interested in in doing this or that, but most of the time I'm I pretty straight with them. I've had two children since I was DJing, and um, I just haven't got the energy for it now. And and a lot of people want the promotion side of it and ticket sales, and I'm like I'm so disconnected now from that part of the industry. Um, I'm just in the studio, so I'm, I'm I've got I could probably ring up all my old ticket punters but they're, they're probably the same age as me now and feeling much the same <laughs> they might not be up for it anymore you know what I mean so I don't know well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put listen listen to this promoters out there the first <laughs> promoter that can get Lisa C back in the clubs I'm gonna bake <laughs> the cake okay that goes out to the first promoter that can get Lisa C back in the clubs I'll bake you a cake <laughs> wow <laughs> Let's see who can let's see who can get you back in there, but I know you. I know it's gonna be hard work because they they've got they've got to try and win you over. Because I hear what you're saying. It's like life's different now. When you when you got your kids and it's like, is it gonna be worth me coming out of my warm bed to go and play here? Mm, I get it. I hear a lot of DJs and MCs saying this nowadays. Mm. So yeah, definitely. It's like, I'm gonna put a light on because it's getting dark. Yeah. Right in here. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um yeah, I'm I I 
I love the idea of maybe going back to radio at some point because I could do it remotely from home. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that might be an option at some point. But at the moment, my schedule is so full up with children stuff and obviously fitting my work around that. I mean, sometimes I have to record my adverts late at night just so the house is silent. Um, you know, and I'm flitting between life coaching and doing the adverts, um, the advert people. Um, so yeah, I'm really busy most days and then fitting housework and stuff in. See, when I lived on my own, being a DJ, I could DJ all weekend, go home, sleep from Monday's Wednesday, clean the house and you know because no one else is there there was no mess to clean up but if I even leave my house for one day at the moment it's like a bomb's gone off so you've got to keep on top of all these things as a mum keep on top of all of the work and by 10 o'clock at night my brain's gone it's ready for bed <laughs> so yeah radio might be a possibility at some point um I mean in the front room we've still got all of our decks and CDJs vinyl decks um the Do you have a mix every now and then um, Michael puts them on all the time. Like I, I married Michael J. He's a DJ as well. Yeah, um, no, I know. I, I need to speak to him actually soon. Actually, I need to get him on there. But yeah, he's. I mean, he's still doing festivals. He's still yeah. doing um, sets with people, mm -hmm. um, and he still he he gets it out more than I do. A mix. I think the last time I had a mix was last year, um, and that was just to prove a point that I could still do it. Um, I think it's on TikTok actually, um, but yeah. It's it's just not something that I think, oh, I've got 10 minutes or I've got 15 minutes, I can't have a mix. If I've got 15 minutes, I, I'm going to do something like, you know, meaningful, uh, more meaningful than that, something that's going to be useful for everyone. So I've I've started putting everyone else before um, before myself. And back when I was a DJ and I was single, it was completely different. I could be selfish and come and go as I pleased because um, there was no one no one to look after and I, no one to be accountable to so <laughs> I could do what I wanted but yeah life's different now okay yes yes indeed okay so what have we got to look forward to then anything in the pipeline that you're keeping hush about or anything um, what's the future hold for Lisa? Uh, really most of my future's holding at the moment is like voiceover stuff that I can say I've done bits and bobs of um that are on television or on radio um i did a metropolitan police drive i uh, met police would <laughs> be the best Ooh, or, okay. was, was it the army i can't remember it was last year um but yeah things like that but i don't really even post those anymore on the advert people's feed because we've got so much on there now that already showcases what we can do um, I now just mostly post video content that we can make for people. I mean, that's an exciting little thing that I do that's an offshoot of the audio stuff. I now do digital content with video and voiceover. So people that can't make their own social media posts for their business, um, I do them for as little as a tenner. Um, it, it doesn't take me long to do. Um, and yeah, so I'm just trying to expand the advert people business. And I've also I'm also life coaching, which is... What I'm really excited about because um very much into natural medicine and the life coaching is is taking me in that way on that on that journey as well um and that, that's that's been probably um the biggest transition for me because I'm going from always being in the music industry and doing music stuff to now being face to face with people and helping them with their problems um but I also have incorporated the music into that because I make meditation, guided meditation soundscapes, mm -hmm. uh, healing frequency soundscapes for people that want to be more productive with their um, their cognitive issues or memory, things like that. So there's lots of different frequencies that you can use to, to heal yourself whilst meditating. Um, and I make those either as just audio or with visuals as well. Some people like to watch relaxing things whilst they're doing it. Not everyone wants to shut their eyes. And people use them for giving up smoking, you know, for anxiety. Um, but I'm still making music, which is the best bit. And I'm still doing voiceovers because I've got to do the voiceover on it. Um, is there, so is there, is there a, a website or a link that you want to you say on here that people can follow you on? Yeah, for your yeah you can find all of that on uh, www www.psychedelicsounds.co.uk thank you um, or the advertpeople.co.uk as well for the advert 
um, side of things. But yeah, for the soundscapes and the tailor-made stuff, it's psychedelicsounds.co.uk and you can then find out about the life coaching side of things on there as well. But yeah, it's exciting um, to be doing something that still incorporates music, but is helping people at the same time. It's, okay. it's a good feeling. No, well yeah. done. Seriously, I'm well proud of you, Lee. Seriously, oh, well <laughs> proud of you, Lee. Um, yeah, I used to love playing sets after you as well. Like when I would come down back to Night Farm, we'd be in the baby box and wherever he was. Yeah, you used yeah. to make me a bit paranoid actually because you would stand and watch my mixing, like <laughs> really watch it. And I can remember what the first time you did it, I started shaking. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to mess this up because I, I was like, I don't even know. Like I knew your face. I was like, I'm not quite sure. It's so dark. I was like, is that is that Red Lock or is that like someone else? And I'm panicking on the decks. And then you stood there and you was like watching me really intensely. And I can remember it was so dark in there that I had my phone. It was dark in there. I remember. Yeah. And I had to look up with my phone on the thing and I was really panicking. And, and that was when you called me Lisa, listen and learn C. Because I took about 10 minutes to mix something. I think that was nerves. I was like, oh my God. Well, Lisa, I, all I remember you, you was a wicked DJ. And I remember complimenting you on your mixing. Because your mixing was tight. It was clean. It was Thanks. really clean. Yeah. Yeah. Good old days. They were good old days. Seriously. Yeah, they need to get a lamp in that baby box, though. This is a nightmare behind there. And I, now I need glasses. And I, it's from years of looking at computer screens and being in poor light and trying to read CDs. <laughs> yeah. you know, oh, well, I'd have a torch in my mouth, but it's never good when someone talks to you, you've got a torch. <laughs> 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 but, yeah. Well, listen, um, yeah, they were fun times. Yeah, well, listen, it's it's been an honour to speak to you again. Um, give my love to Michael um keep up the good work um, thank you and like i said to promoters do everything get her back Stop in the it. clubs i will bake you a cake where's my cake <laughs> lisa we'll catch up again soon all right you take care Thanks. and thank you very much thank you darling take Bye. care yeah.